just briefly, uh, my lab is generally interested in mutational processes. Okay? So you've perhaps seen pictures like this. You sequence the genome, and then we'd like to figure out where the mutations are, and then understand them. So the subject of today is really a sort of more generalizable mathematical way of thinking about these mutations. Okay? Uh, if you are totally new to this field, you might want to look at a review paper that I wrote with uh, other pe people in my lab. It came out uh, last, uh, at the, uh, in December of last year. In the early days of genome sequencing, we really talked about point mutations, like one base pair changes and indels, and then copy numbers. But really, there are a whole lot of things that uh, you can find. And so this is still a pretty active area. Uh, and there are lots of things that are not possible with short read data. Um, but we're getting better, and we now have long read data to use as benchmarking tools, right? And so we can actually can develop short read-based tools and then figure out whether they're correct or not. OK, so the main topic is mutational signature analysis. I'll try to motivate that by giving you some examples. I think most of you know that lung cancer and melanoma have different mutational profiles. Okay? Lung cancer, if you just sequence a, a patient with lung cancer, um, you see a lot of C to A substitutions, a lot of C to Ts. If you sequence melanoma samples, you see a lot of C to T, but no, uh, not much else. If you sequence gliomas, okay, you actually see something that's similar to melanomas, okay? a lot of C to T. Okay? But the sources of the mutations for these two cancer types are very different, right? Well, it turns out that if you look at not just a single base, but its neighboring bases, okay, trinucleotide context of the substitution, then you can actually tell them apart. And so, rather than just looking at one base pair change uh, in its isolation, we're going to look at its context. So we look to one base to the left and one base to the right. And because of you have four other, four on each side and six, it's six because you know, the uh, uh, opposite strands are, are hard to distinguish. And so if you look at the brain cancer samples and you look at 96 uh, uh, dimensional vector, right? So for C to T, I look at all the neighbors, okay? So that gives me 16 here, okay? So if you look at the, the 16, so the, still the substitutions, single base substitutions, but it's context, then they look very different, okay? So there, each mutational mechanism tends to generate mutations in a different context, different trinucleotide context, okay? And so the idea is that we're going to use the context to figure out what is causing the mutation. So how does this work? Well, it is actually pretty complicated because when you sequence a tumor, it's not just one process, right? I mean, I've given you the melanoma case, which is probably the simplest, but in fact, you have multiple processes they act at different times for different durations, right, on different um, uh, groups. And so suppose you have three processes, three biological processes, okay? And then you make an observation, okay? So I sequenced a cancer case, assume that there are these three processes, I make observations. Well, I can't figure out what those three processes are, right? Because I only have one sample and three possible processes, okay? But if you have a lot of samples, okay? If you have 100 samples, 1,000 samples, you can actually start to tell which are the underlying processes, okay? Those, that, so that part is the mutational analysis part. Okay, so how does that work? Okay, if we have enough observations, then we can use some pattern recognition algorithms to discover the signatures. Okay, it's called non-negative matrix factorization. I'm sure in your sophomore or freshman class, uh, you've learned matrix factorization. Uh, this looks fancier only because of this non-negative part. Okay? It's non-negative because 
each of these processes should have a positive coefficient, right? So that's the only complication. Okay, the first paper in this topic. What they did was take all the samples that they could find, 500 whole genomes, 6,500 6, whole exomes, and then did this matrix factorization. and said, what are the underlying building blocks that make up the signatures? And so they came up with 30 or so, of which I was part, came up with a bigger catalog, although I wasn't involved in this particular process. And so every time you have more and more data, you have a greater power, statistical power, to find these signatures. And so the catalogs keep getting larger and larger. And so there are uh, 85 signatures on this one. Okay? In, fact, in fact, when you have more data, you can do double substitutions and indels, and now you can do copy number and structural alteration uh, signatures. So that process of trying to look at the spectrum that came from multiple processes and then doing some uh, matrix operation and coming up with signatures is the subject. Okay? And it turns out it's useful for everything. It's one of these things where when, after you see the paper, you realize, my goodness, this is such, a great, such an obvious idea. Why didn't I do it? Right? Uh, so I'm going to show you two examples of how we've uh, uh, worked on this, improving this. So one is to uh, discuss how to do this in the context of panel sequencing data. So panel sequencing is uh, what is typically done if you, are, if you go to a hospital right now. So any major academic hospitals in the US, many of the hospitals uh, in Korea, if you have uh, cancer, they might do a panel sequencing. Okay? So you hear a lot about you know, whole genome sequencing. My lab had been doing whole genome sequencing. That was our main thing. I mean, I, when I started seeing whole genome data, I thought, wow, this is going to be the way of the future. We're going to you know, develop algorithms for this. But it turns out that panel sequencing is uh, what still goes on in the clinic, okay? because whole genomes are much harder to interpret. Of all the signatures that I told you about, there's one signature that are, that's really important for this project. That's signature three. Why is it three? Because it just happened to be the third one. There's no reason that it, uh, there's no other reason that it's uh, signature three. Single base substitution, because we're still talking only about point mutations, right? Now, this signature, I mean, these bars look kind of random, but they're not, okay? This pattern is found in BRCA one or two mutant tumors. So there are many ways that people have shown that this signature is related to BRCA mutations. Right? Uh, you can actually do CRISPR gene knockout, okay? And so you can, wild type has this, but if you knock out components, okay, of that pathway, like here's BRCA1 and 2, the, uh, the mutation profile that you see just look, you know, looks like signature 3. Now, the problem is that this signature is harder to detect. Okay? If it has a peak at some of the bars, uh, but, but you know, empty in other bars, it's a little bit easier to detect. But because it's relatively flat, it's harder to detect. Now, why are we interested in uh, detecting signature three? Because if you have signature three, you should be considered for getting what's called PARP inhibitors. I'm not going to tell you much about how this actually works, but this is a relatively new class of drugs. There are a lot, tons of papers, um, 134 trials right now, uh, but this was a while ago. There are a lot more. There are major companies are all developing PARP inhibitors. Okay? And so if you can figure out which cases have BRCA1 or 2 mutation in uh, right now breast cancer, you are eligible for a PARP inhibitor. But what we thought was, it's actually not just breast, uh, BRCA1 and 2 in breast cancers, but lots of other genes that might give the same uh, uh, phenotype. Okay? So in fact, you can actually sequence BRCA and find mutations, but there are other genes in the same homologous recombination, deficiency, uh, recombination pathway that can lead to HRD. Okay? So for instance, 
epigenetic silencing, right? BRCA might be uh, silenced by methylation, okay? Right now, we can't detect it unless you specifically test for it. There are other genes, okay, here. Probably two we know about, RAF51C we know, but who knows what other genes are involved in the same pathway. But regardless of the specific mutation, they will all generate signature three, okay? And so, comprehensive identification of homologous recombination deficiency, which is related to PARP inhibitor, will increase the number of people who can benefit from this. Okay? Uh, mathematical question here. The mathematical question is that when you have panel sequencing data, uh, it, the math problem gets a little harder. So there was a paper uh, from the Sanger Institute in the UK that, you, that used whole genome data to identify these signature three cases. There was a, a paper in Nature Medicine, um, and a lot of people figured out that it was really a good idea. But in reality, in practice, when you go to a hospital, they don't do whole genome sequencing, at least not yet, okay? They'll do panel. So the question was, can we do that from panels? All right, so there are lots of samples that we could look. So there's a project called Genie, where multiple hospitals try to pull samples together. A company called Foundation One, a company called Foundation Medicine has a panel called Foundation One. They are doing hundreds of samples. Um, we are working right now with another company called Tempest that have that has done hundreds of thousands of samples. Okay? The problem is uh, mathematically, when you have whole genome data, you have a lot of mutations, right? But when you have panel data, panel just means you only sequence a small number of cells, a uh, small number of genes, excuse me, small number of genes that you're interested in, okay? The data are much sparser, okay? So the question is, can you look at, you know, maybe 20 mutations and still figure out whether it's signature three or not, okay? When, when I first saw this problem, I thought this can't be done, right? I mean, how can you figure out what this, that this came from this rather than some other signature? Too hard, I thought. But though I figured out, uh, the, the uh, postdoc that I uh, mentioned figured out how to do this, okay? Now, our goal is right now, um, there is a um, testing you can do. So a lot of patients get sent out another sample for testing by this uh, Myriad, uh, company called Myriad Genetics. It's $4,000. And we thought, okay, well, we, we want to put that company out of business, or at least that asset out of business, because when you do panel sequencing, you can actually get it for free. Okay? Everybody who does panel sequencing can get that information for free. I'm not going to tell you too much about the solution, except just a couple ideas. So one is that if, you were, if I were to just look at that one profile, there's no way I can tell. But we know from a lot of genome sequ sequencing data we already have, some correlation structure between signatures, okay? They're not totally random. They tend to co-occur, okay? Certain signatures like to occur together, and we can feed, see this for per different tumor type, because every tumor type is different, okay? So we utilize patterns observed in previous data sets, and so this was not possible when we didn't have thousands of whole genome data. And then there's a little bit more of uh, mathematical work that needs to be done. It turns out that right now, after almost after 10 years, the uh, software that most people use is based on the work of a PhD student at Sanger, okay? And because they were ahead of everybody else, it just got adapted, but nobody could actually um, spend a lot of time until a few years ago to really think about whether it, it's the right uh, mathematical quest, uh, approach. Anyway, so um, I will just uh, mention the fact that the different tumor types are different in terms of their correlation structure. We take advantage of that and that we use some fancy machine learning way to combine the data and then we can actually do the prediction. And it turns out to be obviously not as good as whole genome data, but turns out to be pretty good for certain tumor types, okay? And so what we find is that uh, of all, this, all the cases that we think are signature three positive, which means HRD, okay, 
A lot of them are BRCA mutations, BRCA germline mutations, okay? A lot of them have somatic mutations in BRCA, okay? But they are actually wild type for BRCA, okay? They have mutations somewhere else, or BRCA genes are mutated by some other me methods that's not a point mutation, okay? And that in fact, if we look across samples, across tumor types, some of these cases have a lot of uh, uh, cases with HRD. We've actually done a lot of additional analysis to show that it works. I'll just, because of time, go through this rather briefly. Uh, we can, for instance, look at um, uh, signature three cases that are BRCA negative, okay? Uh, sorry, BRCA positive, and then compare with the BRCA mutant cases, and they behave about the same, okay? et cetera. And um, we have data from clinical trials where signature three positive and negative groups have different survival. If you were to look at some other assays, so this is a, um, a functional assay that's done in the lab sometimes. This is the $4,000 test that you can do. Okay? We do better than all of them. Okay? So if you, the commercial assay doesn't give you that separation. And then some other ones. So this is the harder one because it's kind of flat. It's harder to distinguish. So the simulation was we mix them as some random fraction, we simulate data, and then we try to see whether we can actually recover these. Okay? Well, it turns out that um, every time you simulate and we try to recover, okay, you get slightly different results. Those are the uh, um, uh, dots here. Well, it turns out that every time I do this, I, I can recover signature 12, eight and 23, so these are kind of spiky. But every time I do it, I don't quite get signature three. I get something slightly different, okay? And so, um, cosine similarity, you might remember from your uh, um, linear algebra class. If I see, the, if the algorithm gives you these four things, I can say, well, actually this one matches 23, okay? So I found that one. This one matches 12, okay? But this one doesn't quite match SPS3. In fact, if I, to, if I try to force it, okay, if I look at the catalog and find some, try to find some combinations that matches what, I, what the algorithm gives me, it gives me signature three, 23, and something else, okay? Because mathematically, I'm trying to figure out from this what the, what the combination of the original signatures is. And so sometimes these things just sneak in, okay? Just because the data are not perfect, okay? Um, anyway, so we have some new algorithm that can fix this sort of problem, okay? Patient signatures is pretty useful. And that in fact, um, if you identify an interesting problem, like the one we did for panel data, it gives us a chance to, you know, think of a new, new, a way to, um, you know, reframe the question so that we can uh, actually uh, do something useful. Um, and again, it's like any other method, false positive, false negative uh, signatures can arise. And so sometimes, you know, we will look at a paper and argue whether it's an artifact or not. You can imagine that sometimes people will um, want to give a therapy based on some signature that they think they find. Okay? So you, you really want to be sure that it's there, okay? that you're not guessing. 